The driver in the lead tank, red-faced and anxious, craned his neck trying to see around the corner of my house. He moved his tank a few feet forward as a couple of 88 screamed in overhead, and thinking better of it, pulled back again. The 88's shells probably ended up miles away. Meanwhile, Siegel, Lieutenant Nations and the runner showed up with the rest of the platoon, shouting over the din of the motors for us to get ready to move out. I ran back into the house to check on the mother. She was in a corner of the kitchen with my German army blanket wrapped around her and the child. She was fairly out of it and did not notice the K-ration and extra D-bar of chocolate I left on the floor near her. My squad was climbing on top of a tank and I joined them, grasping for anything to hold on to. I had no idea where we were going. I assumed we would have to go over the hill, exposing ourselves to the same direct fire that hit F Company. Moments later we lurched forward, exhausts blowing smoke, the hot engine warming our lower bodies while the cold air stung our faces. We swung right, almost pulling me off to the left, and plunged down a steep and narrow dirt track incline that dropped off to the valley where the woman had come from. There may have been ten or more tanks in the column following behind us. The entire company was mounted on these bucking monsters. You had to holler in a man's ear to be heard. At the bottom of the hill, the track veered right a little, and we travelled about one half mile only to stop at a fork. The powers that be consulted maps and radios. Meanwhile, we spotted a highly complicated weapon that most likely had been a 40mm multi-purpose gun, either anti-personnel or anti-aircraft. It was a mass of twisted metal, wheels, ammo containers, tree limbs and human bodies, blown inside out with odd bits and pieces scattered and plastered to anything and everything around. Several of us stood there fascinated. The haphazardly displayed anatomy reminded me of the patterns created from the flesh and hot blood that had frozen in the snow and ice of since, during my baptism of fire back in January. Shouts from the tank brought us back to mount our beasts, and we moved on. Obviously we were moving around the enemy flank, which was some relief, though not much, because who knows what we would find down there. This was definitely not tank country. In fact, tanks always try to avoid forests and hills. Such country has too many places for anti-tank guns or Panzerfaust teams to remain hidden until their optimum opportunity comes. Tanks are best used in open country and desert areas. Daylight was fading. We had covered about four miles from Schondorf when the column halted, and we dismounted to enter the woods on the left. We were formed into a company line about 150 yards long and proceeded to dig in. My hole was on the extreme left and was responsible for the flank. Both Fasco and I shoveled the earth out between some trees. Meanwhile the tanks moved up a few yards behind the foxhole line. Our lead tank was parked some 25 feet behind us. I had no doubt that German patrols were off in the trees watching our every move. Tanks make a lot of noise and can be heard a long way off, but so far all has been quiet. It appeared to me that we were at the base of hills to which we had called in the time on target the day before. Of course the thought ran through my mind that if that barrage had never happened, if the Germans had been smarter in their movement, we might be in one hell of a firefight this exact moment, but we were not, and for whatever reasons, all was quiet. Later I learned that the rest of the battalion on foot was close behind us. At the moment I felt we had overextended ourselves, with a company of infantry and a column of vulnerable tanks practically lost and isolated in the forest. We settled in for the night, two hours on, two hours off, but experience with Fasco made me aware that I would likely not sleep at all. True to form, he almost never raised his head to look and listen. Instead, he stayed as low as possible in his end of the hole, and made ceaseless, unintelligible conversation with himself. I kept him with me for his superior night vision, and had to put up with his fears. For my part, I was cold and hungry. I had one K ration I was saving for the morning, and my last German blanket was gracing the shoulders of the new mother. Well after dark, Manley came over and said he had to put a four-man patrol together, and wanted a Browning automatic rifleman and me as point. I decided Eberly was proving to be steady, and I got him out of his hole and met Manley and Salazar behind our tank. We were to try to locate E Company. We were supposed to have joined up here at the first checkpoint. With Manley a few yards behind me and all staying close, we moved away from the perimeter. Although it was dark, I could usually see the shapes of trees and obstructions nearby. 
But the darkest shapes, as in previous night patrols, were moss, and as before, we passed the word back to step only on the black in order to avoid the crackle sound of dead leaves. After an hour, we returned, having found nothing. Some time later, Lieutenant Nations stirred me out of my hole, and again with Eberly and one other man, we moved out in another direction, up the wooded slopes of Hill 708. We had gone about one half mile or so, moving slowly, cautiously at this point, we still had not come across E Company or any other unit, American or German. Then we all heard voices, lying still. We listened for several minutes. Nations whispered in my ear that we should get closer to find out what was there. About to move, we heard clearly a few spoken words, and they most definitely were not American. So, either this was an outpost and main line of resistance, or a resting patrol, Nations decided we should return to our perimeter and relieved me at point with the fourth man. I lined up behind him, then Nations, and then Eberly. We began moving down slope, but we had not progressed ten yards when a blinding flash completely put out my lights. I could only have been unconscious less than a minute because I came into what seemed a silent dream state of flashing lights. I do not know how long it took me to realise these were tracer bullets drumming into trees, creating violent sparks and ricochets. I could feel the concussion pounding, but minutes would pass before some hearing returned. I found I was on my back, and I began moving my arms and legs. My neck was warm and sticky, probing with my good left hand. I located a scratch on the side of my neck, but I was unnerved to discover that my dog tags, SS rings, Catholic medal and rosary were gone. Then I discovered something warm and slippery on my chest. On the verge of panic, I groped inside my uniform for the mortal wound I thought was there. My confusion deepened, but as my head cleared a little, I found that the fourth man, never got his name, had more than likely set off a mine or booby trap that I had passed on the way up. Other than a headache... I began to gain confidence that I had suffered only a scratch. Meanwhile, the tracers stopped searching, and I was buried in darkness, too scared to risk inadvertently moving on to other mines. I believed our point man was dead, and that parts of him splattered over me. I could sense no life nearby, and knew I had to search for nations and Eberly. Having been in line behind me, most likely they were okay and looking for me, I began groping the area with infinite care until I finally found my identification and the other neckwear tangled together at the base of a tree. My rifle was some twenty feet away, nearer the point of explosion. The SS ring necklace had disappeared. I never missed that witch's charm. I had been blown a fair distance and rolled into a depression in the forest floor that gave some protection from the machine gun. Unbuckled helmets catch the force of explosions if the angle is right, and it took many anxious minutes of crawling about before locating it. The fit was unfamiliar, however, and I realised it probably belonged to our point man. Only after I found the one with netting that felt right did I let the other go, and I saw no sign of the other men, and I sat quietly for a while, trying to get my ears back in some sort of hearing mode. My dog tag tangle went into the upper left pocket of my field jacket, where I kept my chocolate D-bars. A month later, I pulled out a dried mixture of identification neckwear buried in a mass of chocolate and paper wrapping, all glued together by a grizzled parchment-like material that must have been flesh from the fourth man. Whatever the point man had set off seemed more powerful than a shoe mine. It was generally understood that more than 70 pounds of weight would set one off, but by crawling over one buried a few inches in the earth, a man's weight could be distributed over a wider area, and he might survive the crawl. On the other hand, exceedingly little pressure is needed to suffer the results of jiggling a bouncing Betty's prongs hidden in leaves. In the almost total darkness, I began crawling down the slope in the direction I could only hope was the same I had come up. I literally inched forward, gloveless, with all the digital sensitivity I could muster. The sudden touch of twigs on the forest floor caused momentary panic. I finally calmed my nerves enough to realise that the fluidity of the military situation almost precluded the organised planting of minefields here. At the part of the forest where the trees thinned out, I decided my sense of direction had put me in front of the company perimeter. But because my chancy hearing might be a serious disadvantage exchanging passwords, 
I opted to move well to the right and then left to the road. There, I was shocked to walk right into a group of tankers gathered next to their tank. Although I was relieved to have so easily re-entered the perimeter, I intended to raise a little hell about flank security. I found our platoon command post hole and reported to Siegel. He was relieved to have me back, and before I could ask about the others, he told me Nations and Eberly had come in not two minutes before I did. Much relieved, I realised we had been travelling a parallel course on the way back. When I told him of my unchallenged return, he said he would take care of it. The lieutenant, meanwhile, was with the commanding officer reporting on our patrol and had not heard of my return. Before returning to my position, I groped my way to Eberly's hole to let him know I made it back. They had reacted as I did in working their way down slope. At the rear of the four-man column, he had had enough distance from the explosion that he saw me blown and rolling through the underbrush, but the immediate firing of the machine gun put a stop for some minutes to searching for me. We had been groping silently within yards of each other. Salazar, who was in the hole with Fasco, left for his own, and I reoccupied my end. I was hurting and exhausted and needed sleep badly. Fasco was intermittently mumbling or asleep over the next hour. Finally, I lost my self-control as he emitted a snore that could be heard for quite a distance. If it had been daylight, I believe I would have seen that bad film again, and I started punching him on his arms and chest and he snapped awake. I hissed in his ear threats I would never carry out, and probably could not carry out. But he was way out of his element here, I was too, but I had adapted, and he had not, anyway. I made my point and he put his eyes to work. Sometime later he nudged me from a stupor to whisper he had spotted movement. Rising up, I saw only the dark and foolishly whispered there was nothing out there. I never heard the brief conversation reputed to have taken place between a G.I. and a German who was pretending to surrender and who then fired a Panzerfaust or German version of our bazooka. Instead, what I clearly recall is that immediately after I put down what Fasco claimed to have seen, a rocket flashed a couple of feet over our hole and detonated on the tank behind us. Totally taken by surprise, and probably with my mouth hanging open, I took several seconds before reacting. Some of us got off some wild small arms fire, and a rifle grenade was shot off from the hole next to us. By this time, Manley had climbed up to the tank's turret and let loose several long bursts of .50 calibre tracers, which powerfully bounced from tree to tree. Much later, some believed that the figures Fasco saw, that I could not see, made good their escape. Not true. A man groaned out there in the dark for some minutes and gradually grew quiet. I never saw him because we pulled out before dawn, as light began to rise on 15 March. We were reassembled on the road. And because I had been on two patrols during the night, as usual I was considered an expert in the locality. I recall leaning against the tank, which had a track blown off by the rocket attack, and eating my last K-ration. I learned a member of the tank crew was burned, not too badly, by the explosion. Nations and Siegel came over, and I remember how curious it seemed when Siegel apologised, but had to ask me to take the point again. When I had seen him and the lieutenant as they approached me, I cringed and wished I could turn into a tree or be something other than a soldier, because I knew what they wanted. Nevertheless, as usual, I met his gaze, covered up my fear, and answered, It's okay, Sarge. We left the tanks sitting there as Eberly and I moved off through the forest. Hill 708 did not have a lot of underbrush, and the way the trees were spaced revealed generations of good forestry. The occasional trails were designed in a pattern as firebreaks, and the woodsman could reach anywhere on this great hill. It was not all that high, but its gradual slopes covered many miles and supported a variety of big trees, mostly firs. Gradually light filtered through, and as visibility improved, the interval between men lengthened. We were too high for night mist to have formed. It was going to be a perfect late winter's day, and under other circumstances, I easily could have drifted into an idyllic frame of mind. But, for the confrontation we were marching toward, my childhood readings of fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm would have fit well that early morning in an ancient German forest. Mystery abounded in every shadowy grove of trees where enemy infantry waited, not ancient warriors and maidens. In my frequent glances to the rear for arm-and-hand signals, 
I could see our platoon sergeants and lieutenant nations and riflemen trailing behind until I lost them in the trees. It is difficult to describe the weighty importance of the scout experience, the mixture of a responsibility way beyond my eighteen years, and the almost wild sense of pride. The fear of making a mistake that would endanger my company took precedence over personal fear for my own safety. G Company followed along in Indian file for more than a thousand yards. I knew that even though I could not see them. The added weight was E Company following along just behind G, and while tanks can give a sense of security, they also draw fire. All in all, it was better to slip through the woods silently in hopes of bumping into the enemy where they least expected it. The tanks remained behind for the time being. They would slowly find their way to us later over wider trails. I realised that the Germans, more than likely, had men and radios posted where they could keep tabs on us. As I found myself heading toward open area and clearings, I would change direction for areas that offered more cover for us. A couple of times I got the signal to drastically change direction, which I liked, and just before 7am I checked out a dirt track well chewed up by tracked vehicles. It crossed another track 50 yards to the left that I had been watching as I moved. It moved directly up slope, and tracked vehicles had gone this way too. I began walking on the track marks, hoping they were so recent that there had not been time to plant mines. I hated snipers and canny Germans who planted mines as lovingly as farmers plant seed. My hope was to find enough evidence of the proximity of the enemy that we would deploy into skirmish lines right and left, but the only signal I received was to keep moving on. The sky reflected on Eberly's glasses as he shrugged his shoulders, and on up the track we trudged a couple hundred yards. At this point, one set of tracks had cut off to a clearing to the right and chewed its way over stumps and dead leaves until I lost sight of it. Getting Siegel's attention 75 yards back, I pointed emphatically to the deviating vehicle track so he would not miss it. By then, I could hear sounds of an axe chopping wood up ahead. And as in times past, the east wind carried the strong smell of a tobacco that camels and lucky strikes would have turned up their respective noses at. The forest softened sound of a voice somewhere ahead convinced me there was German activity close by. I trotted back past Eberly to the powers that ran things, and because I failed to convince them that I smelled Germans, I was told to get on back up there. Belatedly, I learned not only were we looking for the enemy main line of resistance, but also for another American unit out there somewhere. I stood in the gloom of the trees, shaking and trembling so badly that I had to repeat my message a couple of times. My voice shook too. How much of this was due to the cold and how much to fear, I never knew. The cold was worse in March than it had been in January, or so it seemed at the time. So back up the track I double-timed taking Eberly and his Browning automatic rifle close behind me. Feeling naked on the open track, I went into the fir trees and underbrush on the right. Once more, good fortune was on my side, because remaining on the track would have exposed my right side to a well-hidden German observation post. The path I took, however, thrust me suddenly in front of two Germans, in the act of vacating their slit trench and disappearing through the foliage. I mean, they were out of there fast, and I was out of there fast too, taking Eberly with me and waving my arm at the men below to get the hell off the track. In the blink of an eye they were out of sight, some were deployed to our left, but most of us went to the clearing where the tank, or whatever it was, had passed through. After we were quickly arranged into a rough line extending a hundred yards from the track, Lieutenant Nations and his runner began chopping away with their shovels, and Nations told Eberly and me to dig in next to him. A line of men were working their shovels a hundred feet behind us at the edge of the clearing. The ground was extremely hard with stone and soil frozen like cement. I told Eberly to follow me about twenty-five feet closer to the trees, and we began digging in the broken earth of the tank track, which was easier to remove. But we never got six inches down before we were interrupted by the all-too-familiar noise of a screaming Mimi rocket rushing in. At the same precise moment, an unheard 120mm mortar shell that had been on its way since we deployed came dropping in. We were already pressing ourselves flat to the earth, warned by the rocket, the 120 burst behind me, and my shovel got a jagged hole in the metal blade. Other explosions, accurately placed, followed immediately. Behind me, 
I heard a loud moan I will take with me to the end of my life. It was as accurate a sound as a man could create if he were imitating the noise of a screaming Mimi. I glanced back through the thick smoke and saw the runner staring at the mess that had been the neat and handsome Lieutenant Nations. The shallow shell hole was exactly where we had tried to dig next to Nations. Against the noise of shells dropping in, a new sound of a tank engine and cannon caught all of my attention. It was firing at trees on the other side of the clearing as fast as its gunner could shove the rounds in the breach. I saw men being hit by shrapnel and other men rushing to pull wounded away. Several shouts of pullback, pullback had most everyone grabbing equipment and the wounded moving to the trees and the track. I could see the runner's mouth moving while wide-eyed, he seemed to implore me to do something, but in an instant, with walkie-talkie and carbine in hand, he was gone. Eberly shouted, come on, and headed for the track. On my knees in the process of grabbing shovel and rifle, I saw movement to the front. The silhouette of three men in a close group dropped to the earth thirty feet away under the fir trees. It had to be a machine gun team. I saw their body profiles as they had their focus concentrated across the clearing, where men still milled about with the wounded. The three German soldiers never picked up on my presence, and I emptied eight rounds into their midst. I passed the burned and broken thing that had been a new friend a couple of days before, and I did not stop until I heard shouts all around me at the other track I had crossed fifteen minutes earlier. I found my squad, Rupp and Sanders had been hit, Rupp had gone for treatment to the aid station, wherever that could be in this wilderness, and Sanders had a head wound that Joe, the medic, was getting ready to patch up. Rupp would return in a couple of days, my squad came out of it in pretty good shape. Shells from our own artillery began hitting the area where the self-propelled cannon had been hidden. Our perimeter was positioned at the west side of the north-south running track. Then the German shelling was being walked down the slope to us, and again we began chopping at the earth between trees. More than one direct fire cannon was hitting trees to spray fragments down on our heads. This was in addition to the mortars. I gave up the fruitless chipping away at roots and stone and just lay there next to a 60 millimetre mortar of our fourth platoon. The last thing I remembered at about 7.25am was the sound of shell fragments buzzing through the air and the hollow pock when it would strike a living tree. The next thing I knew, someone was tugging at my cartridge belt. A rifleman was replacing my canteen in its canvas holder. He had been detailed to get refills from a water point somewhere. I realised I was half covered in dirt, leaves and a branch, and I could not understand how or when this happened until a glance at my watch revealed the time as 3pm. I had actually slept through a barrage and escaped the stress of experiencing the reality. I could hear tanks, ours, off to the left, coming up the east-west track in the direction of the clearing where we had gotten hit. I checked on the squad and saw Sanders with his white bandage, Siegel called me over with the other squad leaders and explained the latest news. Nearby, the dead were lined up. Lieutenant Nations was one of them. Other troops were set to jump off with the tanks and attack up the track. Our job was to tie in on their right and provide flank protection to the hilltop and beyond, to a town on the other side of the hill. I availed myself of three K rations from boxes and found the squad had already gotten theirs. Our skirmish line moved out over the track and I could see the tanks to the left with rifleman scouts in front moving up the track. We went fifty yards through trees and shell-smashed branches when rapid-firing machine guns opened up, although their fire was high. Most mortar shells and direct cannon fire landed around the men and tanks that were slowly moving forward some seventy yards to our left. I watched a tall fir tree being hit every eight or ten seconds until it toppled over, then the German gunner up the trail sighted on the next tree to use for a fragment shower. Creeping and crawling, we passed the clearing where Nations was killed. I could see the self-propelled cannon that had fired the tree bursts. It was burned out. I angled to the left toward the track until I found the machine gunners I had shot at. Only two were lying behind the M34. A blood trail led to the third a distance away. I felt little or nothing, only a vague satisfaction. Later, my squad and I were moving with the tank destroyers, and I anxiously watched trees ahead being shelled. I sweated it out until the tree fell before we arrived at it. It was impossible to hear or give orders. 
The tanks made so much motor noise you could see a mortar shell bust yet not hear it. The lead tanks expended 90mm shells, 50 caliber and .30 caliber fair for every suspicious clump of trees ahead, and this way an occasional German self-propelled lead gunner tank was put out of action. We lost the tanks, too. Once again we experienced the smell of burning rubber, sweat heated metal, burned butter, and wood smoke, along with burnt meat. Every so often forward movement stopped, and we would dig in altogether as I hit my old time high of five good-sized two-man foxholes. The digging was better as the IRB went down at asked me a wise at one point. A screaming red-faced major arm signaled my squad to the other side of the road. I understood we were being outflanked on the left, and indeed, we were getting small arms fair from there. So after we crawled around and Salazar had a bullet knock his helmet halfway around his head, suddenly an American top sergeant with almost white hair raised up most bravely some distance away. Hands raised, he approached and shouted in my ear that he was shooting at his platoon. I retorted that he had been shooting at ours and he had some wounded men from under the so-called friendly fire. We reoriented him to the direction he would go and tied into the track on his right. Then we double timed back between the hot and stinking tanks to our place in the line. Siegel or Roberts wanted to know what in hell we were doing across the road, and I gave up trying to explain. That is the way it went the rest of the afternoon when by twos and threes German infantry began trotting along to our rear with hands clustered behind their longer brimmed cats. I confess I gave a good hefty kick in the rear to one prisoner out of war who stopped long enough to say it was happy to be going to the United States of America. He just wanted to hasten his trip in that direction and was not terribly pleased he would arrive there long before I would. The last place we dug in I needed to relieve myself and wanted to do it alone so I left the three or four holes of the squad and wandered off to drop my pants and squat into the late afternoon sunlight that so peacefully filtered to the forest floor. The sounds of combat had petered down to intermittent sputterings, banks and pops. Then I suddenly was besieged by irritated shouts. Looking behind me I was aware of a heavy point thirty caliber machine gun staring me down, probably part of A Company. I had stupidly daydreamed myself into their field of fear. I waved and began pulling my G-pants up when a German strong compiquet out from some new fir trees. Both he and our machine gunners had me with me pants down. The non contrited and nervous said in those hardened lengths and square angles of a face, arms up high. He came out of the shadows for our or so baggy pants many in long brim at caps. They left a pallet of helmets and weapons in the shadows. With one hand holding my pants up and the other trying to brandish my M1 with some authority, I herded them past the machine gunners who were left scratching their heads. The squad watched curiously as their acting squad leader marched past with his capture while holding up his pants. The shooting war on Hill 708 deeded out toward evening. George Company formed up on the track and filed into the village, more so for Hamlet, really. We were moving through the trees and then suddenly emerged in cold damp wind under the village square. There was only one street off the track. It ran downhill both north and south. Another company had occupied the place as the Germans retreated. We took over the hose for the deed and in glancing out an east window, I could see a brick outhouse in a tiny backyard. Beyond was a precipitous drop off of about 300 feet. Obviously Hill 708 ended here, having cut a deep sleep all morning and part of the afternoon. I had no trouble trading off the night hours with Eberly behind a point thirty caliber machine gun on a trout. We each sat on a table by a window overlooking the south road. I had found a geova cut in the house and was glad to have it. The house had a lot of holes and the cold wind found all of them. Hill 708 rose gradually from the west level at office and then did this sudden drop to the east and they hoped there would be no fog down there at the late so I could see far to the east. Maybe I would see a war ending rainbow on the horizon. They stood behind the machine gun force along to me never even seeing to the road I was to cover. It was too dark. The entire night passed without my hearing a single shell or rifle shot only the mournful hum of the wind rising and falling. At times I could hardly stop my imagination from creating voices, individual whisperings and then choruses. I wondered whether I would follow up on my plan to visit the families of good men who had lost everything. The one thing they had in common was their persistent guts. Against all the deep-seated urges to be anywhere but here, they stayed with their comrades until that special light was blown out of them. Before dawn of 16 March, Mackay shuffled into the room, wrapped in blankets as was I, and we stood together a half hour or so without a word passing between us. Then someone from the third squad relieved me at the window. Siegel needed to send out a patrol, and we were it, and I woke the men to some degree of grumbling acquiescence. As usual, only Merrill was up immediately, rolling up his blanket roll and pulling on his equipment. I lit a couple of the tiny German candles we found everywhere. They were like flat white cupcakes about two inches in diameter and sat in brown paper cups. I always had a supply in my pockets. I wanted light to see whether I could catch anyone with his combat boots off, which was taboo. On the lines we had to go many days without removing them, except for an occasional change of socks or to tend to blisters. 
I no longer had concern for my feet. They were finally conditioned to contacting the ground on their outer edges. The calluses in the centre of my flat feet continued to grow painfully deeper no matter what I did. Salazar called me duck feet. We were sent north by northwest, and I used a compass because even with my good sense of direction, one tree looked like any other tree. We left the road and moved through the woods until we came to a road that followed the azimuth I had chosen. The area had been shelled, and we passed burned-out trucks. The dawn was without fog as we came out of the forest onto a bald area of 708. Much traffic had used the road. We passed a number of dead civilians who had been equipped with shovels to keep the well-rutted byway usable. The open area was choked with smashed vehicles, but mostly broken wagons and dead horses. Equipment, all kinds of military hardware, was scattered on the road and well off of it. We examined some 105mm artillery pieces with their hard, tubeless tyres. Bodies and pieces of bodies were scattered throughout. Here we were, already deep into their country. This war was, for all practical purposes, won, but the madness still filtered down from the top. Shafts of sunlight behind us began illuminating distant hilltops. We reached a point where we could see downhill, and nothing moved anywhere. Even the night wind had stopped. Yet all around us we saw brutish testimony of terrible hellish action and agony. More than the dead men, it was the horses, innocent and loyal, who brought tears running down my cheeks. I had not cried for Dan yet, nor for the others. Fasco was the one who figured it out. He pointed out a village in the distance and the set of hills and ridges, and then he looked at me. The day's second dawning hit me like thunder right between the eyes. I realised the incredibly real possibility that we were standing on the bald hill where three days ago our time on target barrage had descended. The more I scanned through the binoculars the hill beyond the village and the ridge to the left, I felt Fasco was right. Weaving our way back through the trail of wreckage, we saw something we had missed before. Two figures were sitting, unmoving, on the front seat of a Volkswagen scout car that was parked alone some distance from the road. We approached, and aside from a few shrapnel punctures, the Volkswagen seemed relatively untouched. The two helmeted soldiers, one a non-com, were coated in dirt and looked and smelled dreadfully dead. Finding no obvious wounds, I assumed concussion had instantly sucked the life out of them. One Luger pistol went to Salazar, and we all feasted on canned sardines before hitting the trail back to G Company, where we reported on the patrol. In 2nd Platoon's house, I explored the rooms on the lower floor and discovered about 40 fur-lined backpacks. Most had large hunks of crude tobacco wrapped in newspaper, a few pipes, clothing and one revolver. The weapon was dilapidated and untrustworthy, so I dismantled it and tossed it out the window toward the drop-off. Upstairs, a shattered bedroom had a six-foot hole in the east wall, and a bed with naked springs, but no mattress, sat on the opposite wall. I stood at the shell hole and took in the vast panorama. Hundreds of feet below, I saw GI infantry formations moving through hedge-road farms and buildings. Other formations milled about buildings or moved on roads. It fascinated me to have a bird's-eye point of view so totally different from all my prior combat experience, where most of what I saw was because I was in the middle of it. The men moved cautiously, pausing often, and the sound of small arms sounded only occasionally. German artillery fire seemed directed evenly between the scene below and the town around me, but only a single shell howled approximately every five minutes in our direction. I decided to risk a nap on the springs, but first I descended to the brick outhouse behind the house where I did my thing, then I rolled up a GI blanket on the springs. I could not have been there long when the howl of the next shell caused me to reconsider the wisdom of choosing this place to rest. Within two seconds I knew the shell would hit exceedingly close, and I pulled my whole body into as tiny a ball as possible. The explosion of the heavy shell was extremely loud and resulted in sustained crashing of masonry. A brick ripped my blanket and the GI pants over my right cheek, and I sneezed from dust, smoke and the sudden stink of shit, and I struggled off the springs, grabbing the blanket for a quick run for the stairs. As I did so, I peered through the dusty atmosphere at shit splattered everywhere, and a combination of brick, wood, roof tiles, and what might have been a broken seat from the outhouse. 
A quick look out the shell hole confirmed my suspicion. Unable to contain the wild laughter, I let it roar as I began a hasty descent. Below was a collection of white faces, white eyeballs and open mouths. They thought I had gone stark raving mad. I pushed through them, trying to stop laughing. Finally, I blurted out, We've got indoor plumbing. Judging by the blank stares, they were now convinced that I had gone off the deep end. Early that afternoon of 16 March, we piled into trucks and having already broken through the enemy's defences on Hill 708, we began the mad dash for the Rhine River some 50 miles east. With Hill 708 behind us, it soon became obvious that the flat plain we were racing over provided little in the way of defensive cover for the disorganised German army, and they were not falling back in an organised retreat. We had broken through their main defences, scattering and leaving behind much of their infantry and armour. As far as the eye could see on the dusty roads, long lines of six-by-six six trucks, jeeps, three-quarter-ton weapons carriers and armoured division tanks moved eastward at flank speed. More and more German rear echelon troops were being corralled. We began passing through the wreckage of German convoys, the result of strafing and rockets from our fighters. The P-47s roared by overhead all day long. Our 3rd Battalion had to reduce 37 pillboxes southeast of Rheinfeld on 16 March. Our tanks smashed through or shoved to the side every type of wagon, vehicle or cannon listed in the German army table of organisation, equipment, crates, weapons, dead men and horses were scattered about. With a sense of growing exhilaration, we raced through towns and villages where most every house had white sheets hanging from windows and balconies. It was not wash day, but capitulation day. We ran into hard-fought as well as feeble attempts to slow us down, as groups of Hitler youth or regular army troops staged a bushwhack in a forest or town. So much was happening so fast that memory fails me with regard to the daily order of battle, although isolated incidents stand out, and the overall situation was revealed to us increasingly over the first few days of the drive for the Rhine. To the south, the Seventh Army also was breaking through, and like our Third Army, thrusting a spearhead east, always competitive, Patton would make it a race to the Rhine. Town after town fell to the 94th and the 80th Divisions of the 20 Corps, and the 80 Division behind us somewhat covered our right flank. Rifle companies and tanks on the point could roll for miles uncontested, and then receive punishing 88 and machine gun fire from Volkssturm troops dug in around a roadblock. Usually they did not hold out long. Nevertheless, our infantry and armour continued to suffer casualties. In one sector, we lost 15 tanks to 88mm anti-aircraft guns, with barrels depressed to cover the roads. Instances also occurred of our fighter aircraft bombing and strafing places already occupied by our troops. To keep the enemy off balance and grab as much territory as possible, we had to keep moving on day and night. Our 300 second was formed into a combat team and mounted on 6x6 trucks much of the time. We would roll along truck after truck, speeding up and then crawling forward. At times we pulled to the roadside while other troops or tanks rolled through, and other times, near the head of the column, we would pull over and listen to the sound of combat ahead, and then move on through smoking carnage. We began leapfrogging battalions. The first would attack and clear a town, and then our second battalion would pass through the first to keep jabbing the enemy off balance. The first battalion, in reserve, rested, the 3rd Battalion, just to our rear, was ready to pass through us as we encountered and reduced resistance. I recall attacking and taking prisoners in a field outside a hamlet. The tanks and vehicles of the Germans in retreat had chewed up the field. As the trucks and tanks of the 3rd Battalion rolled past, we piled into the five or six houses. Three of us took a bed with our boots on, me in the middle. Fully dressed, we slept like the dead for five hours, having had no hot food in many days, we subsisted on K&C rations. Then before light, the trucks, covered in dew, roared up and we were herded aboard. I rarely sat on the bench or floor, but preferred climbing aboard first to stand leaning over the cab with my M1 cradled in my arms. Although I wanted to be in position to spot any snipers or ambush, I suppose my main need was to soak into my consciousness everything I could see. I loved the cold wind in my face and never minded the dust and exhaust fumes, I took in the few faces to be seen peering from windows and tried to comprehend what the peasants were thinking about this display of might. 
Farmers worked their fields, ploughing and fertilising. The all-too-familiar stink of urine from big wooden barrels, attached to small wagons and pulled by horses, stirred my memory. I recalled the night Dan and I got soaked in cow piss when the machine gun riddled the barrel over our heads, and Dan's Browning automatic rifle had its forward sight blown off. So, from 16 March until the 21st, we hightailed it from Reinsdorf to the Rhine. One town we roared through stands out. It had an open cobblestone area in front of a small hotel, and standing in front was a group of young women brazenly watching this invasion of their country. We had captured a fair-sized town, and another battalion moved through our ranks. We marched to a hotel across the street from a railroad station. An earlier bombing left the hotel and station reasonably intact, although the tracks and rail cars were totally blown up, down and sideways. Tracks, light poles and signals were twisted in agonising shapes. They seemed to anticipate metal sculpture that would appear in front of office parks a half-century later. We had a good night's rest in decent beds, one for every man, despite the fact that all of the windows had been blown into the rooms. Next morning, warning shouts roused every man out of bed and into the street. Six Messerschmitt BF-109s were circling the town about 5,000 feet above. We were rushed across to the station and through a door to a cellar, but for the same reason I liked to play lookout in a truck, I remained in the doorway, watching the German fighters. This was my first experience with enemy aircraft, and I made the most of it as two planes broke formation, peeled off, and dived directly at the station. At 5,000 feet, sharp eyes could see a swarm of troop movement crossing the street. As the two planes roared closer, I made out what most likely were bombs underneath. I planned on a last-second dive for the cellar stairs immediately behind me. However, an intense burst of .50 caliber tracers flashed toward the aircraft, immediately scoring hits. I was aware of multiple .50s firing close by, and the tail of one plane and then, amazingly, the other Messerschmitt BF-109 was blown away, both planes sent spinning erratically downward, pieces of aircraft falling free. The two planes had been hit identically and crashed with a series of loud explosions. I guess I was screaming with excitement because the men in the cellar wanted to know what was happening. I gave the all clear and let them know what they had missed. Shortly after, the trucks rolled down the street and we were on our way out of town. Everyone scanned the skies for the other four planes but they were nowhere to be seen while we raced to Leapfrog 1st Battalion. There were trucks and jeeps way out in front and far to the rear. To the left, the fields were flat, and a low ridge to the right paralleled the straight road, and that, of course, is the direction of attack the other four planes chose. They suddenly shot into view, skimming over the ridge, their guns spitting tracers, but their aim was high, passing harmlessly over the trucks. The ridge was too close to the road for them to have time to adjust their fire. They would have had to make another pass, which would have given us time to stop, bail out and take cover. None of that came to pass, however. No sooner had the Messerschmitt BF-109s screamed 50 feet overhead than the air was filled with a drum roll of .50 calibre guns. Tracers slashed by from the ridge, followed in a split second by four P-47s, empty casings falling all around us. I do not think four seconds elapsed from the time the German tracers began this action until four fireballs tumbled across the late winter fields. Four P-47s wiggled their wings as they pulled up in steep climbs over still rolling wreckage. Then they performed a barrel roll of victory and they were off seeking other targets or rescues. No doubt we would have taken many casualties if the Messerschmitt BF-109s had had their second run at us. None of us managed a shot at the Messerschmitt BF-109s it had happened so fast, and the action was quite neat and clean. I wondered whether the German pilots knew that the P-47s were on their tails, and had decided, no matter what, to go after the trucks, perhaps sacrificing themselves. It seems likely that they were rushed into it, because while achieving surprise from the ridge, a right-angle attack could not score the hits that an attack along the road might achieve. They would have been able to ride their fire along the entire line of vehicles, I think if they had been experienced pilots, many were not at this stage of the war, they would have split up, tried to evade the P-47s, and perhaps half of them could have made a strafing run or two down our road. Later that day, after roaring through 1st Battalion and in the vanguard of the spearhead, 
G Company was rolling through a hilly town adorned by a storybook castle on a high hill east of town. Beyond, I could make out a flat plain and villages. The trucks were in low gear, moving downhill through the main artery, when the rushing whine of artillery shells was heard. We did not have to do much head-scratching to realise that most likely a team of German radio operators was in one of those castle towers. So far, the fire the operators were calling in was falling short, and we did not pause on our way through town. Once out on the open plain, we floored the gas pedal as we were barrelling along a few minutes after leaving town. The first shell, an 88 this time, came screaming in, but it fell short 100 yards. A quarter mile ahead, a few buildings and a high wall beckoned as possible protection, unless enemy infantry were waiting there. In seconds, another 88 hit about 50 yards closer, and the captain's jeep screeched to a stop. All five trucks halted, and everyone bailed out to dive into the V-shaped slit trenches that lined most German roads, and although I usually was first man to board a truck, I was also last off. The third shell was ripping through the air, and instead of a normal jump to the road, I dived, which saved my life. At the precise moment of my jarring ground contact, the shell burst fifteen feet away, and a terrible rush of shrapnel zoomed where my body had been a quarter second before. Red-hot shards sliced through the tailgate and flattened tyres. They would have ripped through me, killing me almost instantly. It was perhaps my closest shave. Counting seconds and visualising gunners who, having thrust another round into their long-nosed gun, were adjusting their aim a notch higher, I was up and on my way to a nearby slit trench. But as I braced to dive into it, three white-faced G.I.s looked up at me. No room, one wide-eyed guy shouted, Come on in! And I certainly did, right on top of them. A flame burst and smoke erupted as the fourth shell scrambled GM truck parts overhead, and I shot out of the trench to find better accommodations in the direction of the stone wall. Most everyone used those seconds between shells to do likewise. So far I saw no sign of dug-in Germans there, which would have put us in an interesting crossfire. Someone on the other side of our blasted six-by-six was shouting for a medic. I had spotted a vacant slit trench on the other side of the road, but as I ran past the front end of the burning vehicle, I saw a second man down and changed course in his direction. His upper body and midsection were a mess of blood. The next shell was due at any moment, bellowing, Medic! I grabbed his feet and pulled him the short distance to the trench. The shell burst farther away to the northwest, and none of the other ten or twelve rounds came too close. So my moving him, dragging him, actually proved unnecessary, and could not have helped his condition much. He was screaming in agony. I kept yelling for a medic, but some of the company had already worked their way near the wall and buildings, with the rest close behind. In the drifting smoke, I saw our platoon medic working on somebody, with a couple of riflemen aiding him. I pulled out one of the morphine ampules I had grabbed from our former platoon medic after Schommerich, and I plunged it into the pained soldier's bloody hand and then used my bayonet to cut away his uniform. I undid his web belt and saw no ammo or weapon, but I pulled out his bandage. That was absolutely useless, however, as the cutting away of his clothes revealed a string of smoking sausages. That was my first perception, at least. But the reality quickly set in. I suppose I froze at the massive diagonal opening that overloaded my mind with the sight of just too much revealed anatomy. I retched and then recovered. Using the bandage to wipe away blood and dirt from his face, I was totally shocked to see, not a member of my platoon, but a young black man who was especially strangely pale. He had to be our driver, which explained why he carried no ammo. I could see the tight black curls of his race under his knit cap, and my heart melted. It was the first time I had cried in many years, and I did not even try to figure out why this emotion let loose just then. He carried no weapon, he was a truck driver, and I suppose the fact that he was a non-combatant was part of the emotional equation.